Good evening and welcome to On Point with Ellen Whippy Knight, where we talk to successful women and men of Fiji, wherever they may be. This evening, I have with me one of Fiji's most recognized and respected campaigners for women's rights and human rights, Shamima Ali. Hello, Shamima. Hi, Ellen. How are you today? Good, thank you That's very much. great. I haven't seen you for a really long time, but that doesn't mean that I don't know what you're doing. And Shamima Ali is one of our most successful campaigners, as we've just said, and she is now the major coordinator and runs the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre. When I first saw you come out and the first ads and was here in, in Suva, and I saw what you're doing and I thought, well, it is about time. Why do you think I would have said that? Because I think all of us are survivors in one way or other yes. and you know as we grow up we see many many women who have gone through this mm. domestic violence rape all sorts of sexual abuse and so on but no one ever spoke about it mm. though we knew it was happening yes. no one talked about it yes and so and the thing is when i first saw you at usp as a student in your graduating year um the, the thing that i thought most was that you were going to become a politician you know, it, you had it in you, you were a superb communicator, intelligent, you hung around with the people that did get into politics at that time. And, and what was the, the variation where you decided to come into doing such a thing as the head of the FWCC? Well, I think my own experiences, you know, yes. my mom being a survivor, uh, I myself am a survivor. And you know, looking at people around me, I always had a very strong um, you know, liking for justice mm. and, and fairness and mm. wanted that done all the time uh, and uh, demanded that in my own home, got beaten up for it also and things like that. So when I was at university, I was quite a casual student, you know, um, but... Uh, a smart casual student. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I thought I'll just get along. I wanted to make money. I wanted to, you know, have a good life and so on. And I went into the teaching field, That's right. but I always wanted to do something else. And mm. while I was in England uh, with my ex-husband, while he was studying, I was looking after him as a dutiful third world wife. Yes. Uh, but I also did other things and I followed all the feminist groups around and I decided that's what I wanted to do uh, on campus. Even mm. though I wasn't a student, I followed them around and uh, listened to what they were saying, started reading a lot and meeting like-minded people and a friend of mine sent me a letter, at that time we had the snail mail, and yes. sent me a letter and said, uh, hey, I know the place for you, you're going to come back and join this crisis center. And that's what I did. And once I went there and I knew what it was all about and so on, uh, there was no looking back. That is where I wanted to Well, you to haven't be. looked back because it's 35 years you've been in there. Yeah. It was founded two years after you joined. I just want to go back a bit and talk about, you know, just the, the generic um, a generic angle of domestic violence, you know, where does it come from? What makes a person want to abuse somebody else and most of all their partner, their wife? Well, I think it has to do with how we are all brought up and how men are brought up with a great sense of entitlement uh, and we call that the genderization genderizing process where we are taught from the time we are born, we are taught from our home through everywhere else we go. As a girl, what are you supposed to be, what your role is? And often the girls are given more of a, you know, inside the house kind of role, follow your mother around, do the cooking, cleaning, and respect men and cater for men's needs and so on. The boys are taught, you know, you're the heroes, you're in control, right. be right all the time and so on. So they grow up that way and everything is done for them and they enjoy a lot of privileges. Yes. So and you know that ownership they see their grandparents, the way they treat each other, the grandfather, the grandmother, the mother and the father and other male members within the family and how the women take it on. So you know that's where it's coming from and men who what I call the bad, bad human being men, they take it all on and grow up with a great sense of entitlement and part of that is ordering women around and uh, um, forcing them to do what they want them to do and then the beatings come because of the whole sense of ownership of women and so on. So it's and not you simple. think that in, in our society yeah. where the, the um, matri matriarchal society where they think that everything that the men do is always correct and women must follow suit and if you should stand up and challenge that, the treatment you get for the challenge is mm -hmm. deserving. 
Yes, yes, yes. Patriarchy. And does that, when a child is observing that, yes. does that they then say when they're a little older and they get into that situation, well, my mother wore it and, and I must too. Yes, definitely. Right. You know, because a lot of it is about watching. Yes. Watching behavior yes. and learning from that. Yes. I'd like to um, just stay on that and then come back, when we come back in the next um, session, I want to talk to you about a, a saying that I heard a long time ago. And um, it's your, you know, like, like mother, like, like mother, like daughter, like father, like daughter, those kind of things, and whether that applies to this. And also um, an, an, an Irish saying that I've just got to try and remember, but I will come back and talk about that because it really is a very concerning subject for the younger generation. Okay. We'll be back with Shamima Ali, the head of the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre. Welcome back. You're on, on point with Ellen Whippy Knight and with Ms. Shamima Ali, the coordinator and major contributor and organiser of the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre. Shamima, we were talking about violence in the home and domestic violence in the home. I, I wanted to ask a question on do you think that this occurs, uh, th this occurs because people have less resources? There's a socio-economic um, condition, situation that people find themselves. Are they, you know, the less they have, the more violent the situation could be? No, not at all. Because if you really look at who does it and where does it happen, it happens everywhere. You have, like, the professionals, uh, right up to taxi drivers, unemployed, and so on. So it happens everywhere. You can't say that a particular section of society uh, does not have any form of violence or domestic violence mm -hmm. or rape and so on. So it cuts across all the barriers you can think of. Yes, sometimes people do make the excuse that it's the financial stress, it's the poverty, and so on. Poverty does exacerbate. You know, it right, doesn't yes. uh, exacerbate the situation, particularly for the woman when she has nowhere, nothing to do, nowhere to go. He's taking out all his frustration on her and so mm. on. So, but uh, if you look at who does it and where does it happen, it's all over the place. Right, because, you know, mm. um, in the part of Sydney that I live in, uh, you know, it's where the, the housewives of Sydney live and, and all of that and, and, and all this pretentious lifestyle. Um, I actually read a report, it was in the Daily Papers, the Sunday Papers, and it talked about how the increase and the high percentage of domestic violence in the mm. eastern suburbs. I was quite shocked at that because I sort of thought that domestic violence related to people who did the have-have-nots um, and the frustration that you talked about, but mm. apparently it is very prevalent in that area. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons they don't report it is because they don't want to look like a victim. Mm -hmm. And so they um, deal with it every day, they hide it from their friends, and then it becomes so bad that you know, the, the, the police get involved. Yes. Is that the situation in Fiji? And yes. do you think that because of the way we were brought up, um, you know, we, we're very open with ourselves when you're talking about people's birthdays, mm -hmm. family functions, social life, but when it comes to a situation like that, mm -hmm. all of a sudden there is a um, tightness and mm -hmm. lack of willing to mm -hmm. discuss the subject. Yes, we call it the conspiracy of silence. The conspiracy so, of silence. And often it is protecting the perpetrator, the person who's doing it. But that's because of yeah. fear. It's fear, but it's also his status. Uh, what will everyone say? Uh, and then also the stigma she will go through. Because mm. if she comes out with it, people will be blaming her. It's because of you, what you did, that is why. You know, so there's a lot of blame the victim syndrome. That is a real terrible point, that, mm -hmm. and it really is a significant yeah. one. Because women, I have been a member, uh, you know, uh, a victim of domestic violence, and I'm sure there are many more women out there, and I've never been afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the thing is, I did talk about it, um, and until people said to me, if you continue, then we will retract our support for you. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, yep. you need to do something about it. Mm. But in these situations where women are weaker, you know, um, and can't stand up for themselves mm -hmm. and fear that they're going to lose their financial support, mm -hmm. they could lose, lose their children, yes. Yes. at what point do they give up and say, right, I've had enough of this and I need to call the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre? Yes, they have been in it for quite a long time before they will do that. What is good to see with the younger generation, with the new generation now, you know, we've been around for what, nearly 35 years now. Yes. So 
the younger women now, the professional women are coming out a lot sooner than their mothers did or their grandmothers did. Yes. But for women to come out, it takes a long time. She's always giving him a chance. Everyone else around her is telling her to reconcile, to, uh, to keep the family together, like it's her fault, the family mm. is coming apart. So there's a lot of burden on her to keep it together. And, uh, you know, and uh, family pressure, uh, fear of him. And in the end, also women still love him. They just mm. want him to stop the bad Tell behavior. Me about it. Yeah. Yes. So, but you know. let's just look at the man himself. Mm -hmm. So here's a woman trying to, hoping that he will change. Yeah. I'll just hang in there for a little few more, you know, months, yeah. a few more days, for the sake of the children mm -hmm. and for the sake of stability in the family place. Put yourself in the, in, in the men's shoes. Do you ever think about what he must be thinking? Oh yes. Oh yes. Yes, I mean, the look, perpetrator. The perpetrator. The, I have worked with perpetrators and it's very difficult to do. So I don't work with them very willingly unless I'm mm. forced to and the, and the woman wants me to work with him or my counselors to work with him. Uh, it's, he has a great, you know, he believes it is his right. He owns the he woman. Does? That is the attitude, yes. So what's the big problem here? And it's all her fault. She did not do what she's supposed to do. She did not keep my food warm. She did not offer me a cup of tea. These are the kind of things that they right. talk about. And so that sense of entitlement is there. So they will show, you know, there's a cycle of abuse. There is the tension period when he's angry, he's swearing, pushing her around. Then nothing is done. The violence breaks out. And then he suddenly he'll show some remorse. So the honeymoon period, we call it. He'll say, I'm so sorry, and take out the vicks and everything and rub it and, and you know, uh, get her to, to places where she, he doesn't usually do. So she gets lulled into this sense of security. This yes. is the husband she False wants. False sense of yeah. security. And forgives him, forgives right. him. And then it starts Until again. the next time. Because no one is telling him he is wrong, mm. you know, and things like in, that. So. In, in, your, in the crisis center, do you, when, you, when the women come up to you and you take them in, and I remember where your first place was um, at, uh, in... Uh, Gordon Street there in the corner of Gordon Street and Thurston. Uh, is there a cycle, is there a, uh, a system that you go through so that they get withdrawal systems, um, symptoms, sorry, from this relationship? So where they eventually can say, right, you know, I cannot do this anymore. I will not go back. Never mind mm -hmm. how nice he is to yeah, me. Yeah. She eventually does. You know, many women still remain. And, you know, it's, it's really funny. Women don't realize once they start taking, uh, you know, some action, get the courage to do it. But the more information they have, they know about the law, they know about their rights. And that's why this awareness is so mm. important. Once they start doing that and start, they start, you know, standing up to him, he backs off because he's a bully. Yes, you know, and this this one here talking back, and so he loses that power, that that power. But to isn't that when they so when they feel like they're losing power, isn't yes. it when they really start to get violent? Yeah, yeah, they they do. But if she does stand up and say, "I know the law now," and things like right. that, they, he has, and so they. they it's still the violence will happen, but less so women say. And when the boys grow up, the sons grow up mm. and stand up to their fathers and things like that. You know, so, so that's, uh, that's when uh, they, they do that. But when women do realize, they will come and go, come and go. Yes. You know, there's many reasons right. why they don't leave. But eventually, we are finding that women deciding. Yes, because no, I went there that, yeah. and I, yeah. not, I didn't come see you. I didn't have to go that far. Yeah. But one day I just said, that's it. That's yeah. enough. Yeah. I'm a human being and I'm not going to be treated yeah. like this. It is stopping my career and it's stopping me from developing myself. Mm -hmm. And the day I did that, even though it was late mm -hmm. as it was, mm -hmm. I started blooming and blossoming from mm -hmm. there on to yeah. be able to be meaning to carry on in life yeah. and do where, you know, to get yeah. to where I am now. Yeah. And I just hope that most other women will do that too. Yeah. But let's um, take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about exactly the system that the crisis, the Women's Crisis Centre uses to take women to that particular stage where they become safe and secure and confident to run their own lives. So we will see you straight after this break. Back to On Point with Ellen Whippy Knight. <laughs> Welcome back. You're on point with Ellen Whippy Knight and with Shamima Ali, the coordinator of the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre. And we're having a really great chat here. It is very interesting. It applies to every household in Fiji, in the world, and not because your household might suffer from domestic violence, but because it's there somewhere in the community and does have an effect on anybody in the community. Shamima, one of the interesting things that I heard was that People called your crisis centre for all the fabulous work that you do, 
saving marriages, saving families, saving children. The names that have been bestowed upon you, and not nice names at all, mm -hmm. and on the crisis center, what was that about? Where does it come from and, and why? I think it was because it was a new thing at the time. Right. Uh, but, and, uh, but, but, but that was 35, this has been 35 yeah, years old. Yeah, but nowadays you still have that coming up. Marriage, right. break, uh, marriage breakers. What ma do they say? Marriage breakers. Marriage breakers. Yeah, it's the violence that breaks up marriages and families. Yes. It's not the crisis center or the women. Right. Um, or uh, men haters. Men uh, haters. Men haters. A uh, bunch of lesbians, which we don't mind at all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but those kind of things. Oh so, you know, so goodness. they think it's derogatory and say things like that. But we've, we've we, you know, but, we've but stood all of that. Is it? Do you know who these people are? Oh, yes. And and I mean, I can. I, I would probably say that um, because it appears that you're protecting women from men, that mm -hmm. it might come from the male side of the yes, community. Yes. But d does yes, that? Does yes. it? A lot of it did come from men. And when men talk like that, I always believe these are the perpetrator types. Yes. And that's why they don't like an organisation that's stopping them from doing all these things. So them, um, a lot of people who are quite conservative, you know, mm. from the conservative section of society, and amongst them, few women. Also, who women. belong to that uh, section right. of society. You said so the on, conservative yeah. side of society, meaning that are they so conservative in the sense that women should solve their own problems without going public about it, or are they conservative in the sense that you're a woman and that's what happens in your household? Yes. And oh you yes, yes, I was also told how many divorces I have had, and therefore oh. I want to break up everyone's marriage. Right. You know, so those kinds of things. yeah. They, so no, actually, it is about women know your place, right? right. Do not talk about these things and right. bring shame to the family and the right. community. Suffer in silence. Right. You know, the self-sacrificial woman, yes. you know, you'd be like yes. that. The, well, those yes, conservative so. people yeah. must absolutely be totally against the Me Too movement. Yes, Are so they yes, the kind definitely. of people that think that you got yourself into that situation mm -hmm. because of you and not because the perpetrator took advantage of you. Yes, exactly. Those are the kind of people who would be against those kind of movements. But you know, what is good, Ellen, is like uh, we have kept saying the same things over and over again mm. for nearly 35 years, and That's now right. it's all coming to fruition. Yes. So those people who, is the, who are the resistors, the detractors, detractors they are now Right. Supporting a lot of them are now supporting, so we're hearing less and oh, less of those. But news. it does crop up every yes. now and then. I mean, you've won so many awards, you know. So mm. obviously something's working, yes. and you're still around 35 years later. Uh, I don't think you're going to go anywhere else because basically mm. this is such a necessary requirement in the community. And I noticed that Daryl Tart, who wrote um, the, the 20th century, 20th century Fiji, mm -hmm. uh, he ma he mentioned you. And of course, my other good friend, Patricia Jalal, uh, does one of the most uh, top 100% most influential, so sorry, let me say that again, mentioned you as being one of the top 100 mm -hmm. most influential people in Fiji. How do you feel mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, I felt it was quite a shock. I didn't know yeah. I was there. I was invited to the launch. So it was really good to feel that. And what it was for was, it, more pleasing was what it was for. Yes. It was for putting women's rights on everyone's agenda. So, yes. uh, so that was quite And pleasing. you've won many other awards as well. Yeah. Let me just tell you what she's won. So she's received recognition for her years of service in the Pacific region on behalf of women, which has included the U.S. State Department's inaugural Women of Courage Award in 2007. I love that one. The Amnesty International Aotearoa New Zealand's inaugural Human Rights Defender Award in 2009 and being named a Paul Harris Fellow of the Rotary Foundation 2009 and Pacific Person of the Year by Islands Business Magazine in 2011 for your work on the elimination of violence against women and human rights. That is absolutely remarkable. Do you think that domestic violence is prevalent only in the Pacific region. And the reason I ask you that is, um, most of us only came to know much about the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre after you set up. Um, I don't know if you know a gentleman called Professor Grant McCall from the University of the New South of New South mm -hmm. Wales, and he mm -hmm. specialises in Pacific studies. Mm -hmm. He once asked me to present a paper to his um, first year students on domestic violence mm -hmm. in the Pacific in general, and, and talk about a case study. So I talked about uh, Papua New Guinea. And one of the most amazing statistics that came out of that was that 50% of the women in Papua New Guinea who die, die at the hands of their husbands. Mm -hmm. I was so shocked and appalled. Is this problem a Pacific problem? No, 
It's a global problem. It's a global it's problem. It's a global problem. A lot of work is being done in the Pacific, a lot of survey, a lot of uh, strategies and so on. You're talking about Papua New Guinea, 50% yes. of women who are murdered, uh, are murdered at the hands of their husbands. Try Fiji. If you look at our statistics, it's about 90% of the women who are murdered are murdered within the domestic violence situation. And 90% of the women in Fiji, 90% of the women who are murdered die at the hands of their husbands. Yes. That is shocking. Yes, that is. What that are we is. doing about that? What is the Women's Crisis Centre? What is your system? Um, well, how do you apply a solution to this? Yes. There is no surefire solution. We try a whole lot of stuff, but we all have to be on the same page. And that is about looking at the gendered nature of domestic violence, of rape, of child rape, and so on, the things that we mm. did, sexual harassment, and so mm. on. So we need to look at it like that. We're doing a lot of community awareness. We're working with men. Our program is called Male Advocacy for Women's Human Rights, where men go through their awareness, change their own behavior, change their own thinking, and influence change in other men. Do you Get have any men that. working in with you? Yes, yes. Because I think it might work if you had men talking to men and saying, yes. mate, this is just the wrong thing. This is not how you yeah. treat, not your wife, but this is not how you treat a human yeah. being. Actually, men can influence other men, but we also say that men, you know, that men listening to men, it's not good practice because then they get, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, get uh, matey. Uh, uh, yeah, get matey and things like that. So it has to, to be a very, with yeah. each other. So they have to listen to the women right. in the first place. Right. But we have men working there, not as counsellors, but my operations manager mm. is a man, a wonderful person. Mm. And we've had lawyers in the past who've been men, and there are lots of men who support us right. and so on, yeah. So, so it's not about... It, you, it's a good human being man. So if you right. do this program, and we're doing it in the villages, in the provinces mm. and so on, we're working quite closely with the And you're always looking for funding, so aren't you? And if there's anybody yeah. out there yeah. with extra funds, yeah. I mean, because none of this yeah. can work on its own. No, yeah. And normally people in that situation do not have the funds yeah. to support themselves. And that's one of the main reasons yeah. why they stay. Yeah. Um, they just need to call the Fiji Women's Crisis. Yes. And, and if you want to, to contribute to a woman to get out of it, girls who are abused and who need to carry an education, we are very, I want to mention our donors who are our donor, our donor partner. Please do. The, We've got a couple of seconds this left. This is Australia and New Zealand governments. They have been very for over 20 years. We have been supported by them. That is fantastic. Thank yes. you to the, the Australian government, the New Zealand government for helping on this. And I hope that the Fiji government is, you know, has played a role yeah. in, in fixing this, pr this problem. Yes. But it's you have also been actually, renowned for the work that you do in research, mm -hmm. um, especially, and one of the best at it. And look, I think we've only t touched, gone to the tip of the iceberg yeah. here. There's much more, many, many, many more layers to peel back mm -hmm. to get to the core of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps we will come back and do that again uh, and touch on that again. So at the moment, thank you so much, Shamima. Um, I am a bit shocked at what you've just told me, and I hope the audience has heard that statistic. But you're on point with Ellen Whippy Knight, and we want to say thank you to Shamima, and we will yes. see you next Monday back here in the studio.